Here to be. Kia ko mausi, nindo shinsi Mike Ford, nindo shiai Ottawa, Kansas. Um, today we're kind of having an educational meeting on how this tribe will pursue the seven criteria of federal acknowledgement through the Office of Federal Acknowledgement of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, we're talking today about the criteria that are necessary to meet for a tribe to submit a petition for recognition to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, when Cleo Caleb Church went to Washington, D.C. in 1978-79 for the Weeks v. Delaware Tribal Business Council, U.S. Supreme Court case, in that same time period, the seven criteria for federal acknowledgement was uh, put into law by the federal government in USC Title 25, Section 837, Parts A through G, or what is the seven criteria for federal acknowledgement. In 2015, that was amended to Section 8311, Parts A through G, and also 8312 uh, acknowledgement for pirate or criteria for previously acknowledged tribes. Um, we that this tribe, the Muncie tribe in Kansas, at this point has two paths forward towards federal acknowledgement. It has the OFA or Office of Federal Acknowledgement, acknowledgement process, which is submitting a petition or lobbying Congress people and senators, U.S. Congress people and senators in this area and in the state to sponsor and support and forward a bill to re-acknowledge your tribe. Um, I'll be very transparent about this. If this tribe goes through the Office of Federal Acknowledgement process you and you meet all the criteria, then you're in the driving seat. You're, you're at the wheel to control your destiny as a tribe. Um, because you've proven through the BIA that you're a fairly acknowledged tribe. If we have to go through Congress, and there are circumstances that might make Congress necessary that, have been, that this tribe was subjected to historically, the, uh, the Congress people in this area may not allow your tribe to have land in a trust or a reservation or gaming rights or jurisdiction. Um, those are the circumstances that you all are up against as a tribe. But as Kevin has stated previously, there's enough here, that there's more than enough here, historically and document-wise, that you all descend from a historically acknowledged tribe. Um, we have been in contact with Kenai Consultants, which is a tribal acknowledgement cons consultation group that works with tribes on federal acknowledgement that is uh, Man, or that is operated by Michelle Keel, Lisa Bergstrom, and Ashley Spivey. And some of the other successful BIA petitions they've worked on were for the Pamunkey Tribe of Virginia that got acknowledgement to the BIA process in 2015 and the uh, Shinnecock Tribe of New York that got fellow acknowledgement through the process, I think in 2009, but they started petitioning in 1978, a long time ago, when the, when the petitioning process started. Um, just to kind of lay this all out, uh, the U.S. government established relationships with tribes via treaties. Before Jalaleman and his descendants, that are the Kilbuck people, were part of the Muncie tribe in Kansas, Jalaleman was with the Delaware tribe and was a, was a, a captain, he was a chief. Um, but because that tribe split over British and American alliances in the American Revolutionary War, Jalaleman was pushed from that tribe, but before he was pushed from the Delaware tribe, he was a signer of the first treaty between, the tri between a tribe and the United States government as a member of the Delaware tribe in 1778. In that period, these, were, these treaties were uh, papers or agreements where the tribe where the government acknowledged the existence of these tribes and the relationship. Um, land sessions land sessions through treaties didn't happen until probably 20, 30 years after that. 
late 1790s, early 1800s, up until the 1830s and 40s and on. But those treaties established a relationship between the federal government and the tribe as a government-to-government -government relation of dependent sovereigns, or of tribes being dependent sovereigns that were sovereign to govern themselves but dependent upon the federal government for protection as established by US, a later U.S. Supreme Court case, Wooster v. Georgia and Cherokee v. Georgia, involving the United States government, the Cherokee Nation, and the state of Georgia. Um, Congress has plenary powers over Indian affairs from Article I, Section 8, Part 3 of the U.S. Constitution, which states verbatim, Congress shall regulate the commerce between the four nations, the several states, and the Indian tribes. Um, and y'all, in your tribe's history, just off the top of my head, the uh, United States government, after your ancestors were pushed to Michigan and almost to the point when they were pushed to Fairfield and Upper Ontario, uh, promised through treaty on September 3rd, 1788, three sections of land, or 12,000 acres, back where Janine Hood and Schaumburn and Salem were in Ohio. Um, your ancestors stayed in Canada. And in 1823, the U.S. government sold that land and put $400, which was a good size, a good sum of money in the 1823, in the treasury for the, for the use of your tribe from the sale of its lands. So it had money on the books with the federal government. That was the beginning of it. That's actually one of the criteria when I get to it later. That beginning money on the books with the treasury with the U.S. Congress is one of the criteria we have to meet. Um, when the tri when the when you all never your ancestors never fully returned to Ohio, some of the Kilbucks had gone to Goshen and had had gone to Indiana uh, to the Delawares there. Some of them had gone back to Goshen in the 1790s and made the made the government think that y'all would come back there, that the tribe would come back there. But after the violence in the Gnadenhut massacre, your ancestors never came back there. So in 1823, after a lengthy Senate discussion, which we've copied off as a document. Um, the United States government sold that land, put the $400 in the sale of the land in a treasury account, and then promised your ancestors through executive order 24,000 acres of the land at least west of the Mississippi River if they returned to the United States, which they did so between 1837 and 1839. Uh, I'm just giving a quick historical example of the relationship between your ancestors and the federal government which meets a couple of the criteria that I'll get to here in a minute. Um, your ancestors were party to the Delaware Treaty of July 6th, 1854, where the Delawares in Article 13 sold your ancestors four sections of land at Leavenworth for $2.50 an acre. They were party to the 1858 Treaty, which took two times to be ratified because they tried to do it without an act of Congress, which violated the Indian Non Intercourse Act, which requires congressional involvement in the Treaty of Tribal Lands. Um, they were also involved in the 1859 Treaty, the July 16, 1859 Treaty, that established the Muncie thing, that established the Muncie and Chippewa relationship out here on this reservation in the Chippewa Hills. They tried in 1864 with the help of the Moravian Church to dissolve the reservation for the benefit of the Moravian Church. They tried in 1868 to move y'all to the Cherokee Nation with the Delawares. They tried in 1873, 74 to dissolve y'all again. Then they tried in 1884 to uh, remove y'all to Indian Territory. And then in 1892, uh, they had another Senate discussion which eventually led to the Charles Curtis Bill and the vote on the bill, and it, the Charles Curtis Bill being proposed in 1896 and then the vote in 1897 and then the act of June 7th, 1897, which led to the whole listing and establishment of land ownership on the reservation because the federal government had not, had not paid any attention to it for 35 years and neglected it, which led to all y'all's ancestors being gathered on December 8th, 1900 and issued patents to their 40 acre allotments of land and $491.13 of tribal funds per capita from the U.S. Government Treasury Fund that have been held in trust for your ancestors since that 1788 agreement back in Ohio. So that means, well, I mean, I'll, I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth in this, but that's, that's proving one of the criteria that I will mention later 
that your ancestors had a fairly lengthy relationship with the U.S. government. Um, kind of gone around a bit, but I wanted to explain the plenary powers that Congress has over Indian affairs in the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. I wanted to explain treaties in the U.S. government. I wanted to explain briefly your tribe's relationship legislatively with the U.S. government between 1788 and 1900, because all these pertain to the criteria. Um, I have a listing of criteria here that were sent to us by the Kenai Consultant Group that you all got as part of a study guide and email from Connie. Um, the first one, I'll read this. The petitioner has been identified as an American Indian entity on a substantially continuous basis. Hold on. Since 1900, and that has been determined since the group's character as an Indian entity has from time to time been, and has not been denied. There's conclusive, conclusive evidence this criteria has not been met. Evidence to be relied upon for an, to establish an identity of one, the combination of the following is identification as an entity by federal authorities. Uh, relationships with state governments based on identification of the group as, an in, as Indians. Dealings with the county parish or all other local governments in relationship based on Indian identity. Identification as an Indian entity by anthropologists, historians, or other scholars. Identification as an Indian entity in newspapers and books. Identification, identification as an Indian entity in relationships with tribes or with other national native organizations. Um, identification as an Indian entity by the petitioner itself. Those are seven criteria that were sent by Kenai Consulting. I know that I have a reputation amongst you all for talking endlessly, but I, and I won't do that today. I'm just kind of humoring myself here. But I will go through these criteria and speak of what your tribe has to meet these seven criteria I just spoke of in definitive form. I mean, I could go on for a bit, but I'll go in definitive form. Um, the number of the first one, identification as an Indian entity by federal authorities. Your ancestors were identified as Christian Indians starting in September 3rd, 1788. Um, your ancestors were identified as an Indian entity in 18, June 3rd, I think it was June of 1823, or March of 1823, when they were offered the executive order land west of the Mississippi, and the land in Ohio was sold from them. They were established, at, they were identified as an Indian entity in, and I'm just going to go off the top of my head here, Great Nemo, or no, uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, Delaware, uh, Sac and Fox, Ottawa, Nemaha, uh, Potawatomi, and Great Nemaha and Haskell agencies from like 1838 to probably about 1930. That 350 something odd page congressional document book that I copied off that has all the congressional documentation fully demonstrates that relationship. We, I mean, we have data, like we have all kinds of data on the size of the reservation, who's assimilated, who's not, what they, what crops they grew on the land, how many people were on the land, how many people, how many people's kids were taken to boarding schools. We have information for days. Uh, I mean, we have endless information. We've, we've come up with, and we don't even have the Potawatomi and Great Nemaha agency records yet, but with the agencies prior to those that I just mentioned, we have 1,200 pages of agency documentation of your ancestors' relationship with the federal government from roughly 1838 to, eight, I mean, with the agency-wise from 1838 to 1875. And we have the spot, the spot relationship when they were promising them land while they were in Canada. Um, so 
We all have identification as an Indian entity by the United States, by the federal authorities. And even though the tribe was dissolved but not terminated post-1900, we have random documentation through reports of the Indian Commissioner about six or seven times between 1901 and 1930. We have records of your ancestors attending a couple different boarding schools like uh, Genoa, uh, Haskell, and Flandreau, and Wapaton attending Indian boarding schools post-1900. We have documentation of your ancestors working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs into the 20s, either as uh, teachers and educators, as reservation superintendents, or as health administrators or nurses. We have all this stuff. Um, we have a 1953 circular that was sent out after the Indian Claims Commission was created in 1946 to attempt to settle the debts that the United States government had with different tribes over mal uh, torts or malfeasances that the federal government had with these tribes in the past for not fully paying them the monies that were owed for their lands. Um, we have BIA letters from 1971-72 extending the period of time to send out letters for claimants on the same Indian Claims Commission issue that was mentioned in 1953, which ended up being the Weeks v. Delaware Tribal Business Council Supreme Court case of 1978, which involved land claim lawsuits by your ancestors, probably by your parents and grandparents, against the, uh, the Delaware Tribe of Indians in Barlesville, Oklahoma, for monies that they felt that they were owed uh, from the St. Mary's Treaty of 1818 in Indiana. I mean, after all, there's only a Muncie, Indiana, which meant some of your people were there and the Killbucks were there. We have all of this documentation, plus Carol Caleb Marks attended Haskell as a non-traditional student in 1972 or three or 73 or 74, a good 67, a good 70 years after the tribe was, was, was uh, dissolved, allegedly by the federal government. So we've got documents for that. Uh, Y'all had relationships with the state government based as your uh, based on your identification as a group of Indians. You all had that. You had dealings with county parish or local governments based on that identity. Um, and I'm I'm not going into specifics with those because there's a lot of them. Um, you guys have identifications as an Indian entity by anthropologists, historians, or other scholars. I've only got 13 books at the house that have stuff on y'all. Um, I'll name a couple. Um, Enduring Indians in Kansas by Joseph B. Herring. Uh, the Delaware Indians by C.A. Westlager. The Muncie Indians by Robert Grumet. Robert S. Grumet. Um, the original, the first Manhattans by Robert S. Grumet. Uh, Indians of Kansas by Robert Richmond. Um, A lot of general Indian history books. The Atlas of American Indians, y'all are in there. Your map, your, the location of your reservation is in that map. Um, Gary Caleb, early on, sent us a letter, shared a letter with us that was sent by C.A. Westlager in the early 70s when Westlager was writing this Delaware book asking him for histor history or information on his ancestors because he knew he was a descendant of Caleb's from the original 1900 census. So there have been, and then you had uh, Truman Mickelson come out here in 1912-13 for the uh, Smithsonian Institution to document y'all's tribal language. You, got, you guys got documentation for days. I've known this for a good two decades. So y'all meet that. Um, and then that kind of overlaps that overlaps into the identification as an Indian entity with newspaper and books. Um, the books I, I referenced in the previous criteria, and with the help of Connie Hildebrandt's awesome work with newspapers.com, we have found original newspaper articles from the 1890s, local and in Topeka, I am basically looking like they were on what was the version of the Associated Press back then across the country 
documenting how your tribe was allotted and dissolved between 1890 and 1901. So we have newspaper documentation. And then we have newspaper documentation up to this day, sporadically throughout the 20th century on your tribe. Um, and then when your ancestors were assigned to all these different Indian agencies, I'll just, I'll run them off. When y'all were at the Fort Leavenworth and Kansas agencies, you were associated with the uh, Delaware, the Shawnee, the Kickapoo, the Wyandotte, and the Stockbridge at those two agencies. Um, when y'all came out here, y'all were uh, assigned with the Sac and Fox tribe of the Mississippi River and with the Roche de Beauf and Blanche's Fork Ottawa tribe. Um, then when the Sac and Foxes removed to Indian Territory uh, in 1869, y'all were assigned with them down there for a couple years in the 1870s in Indian Territory to their agency. And then from 1876 to 1902, y'all were assigned to the Potawatomi and Great Nemaha agencies, which also had the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Vermilion Kickapoo, and the Iowa and Sac and Fox, the Missouri River tribes, and the uh, Black, Swan Creek and Black River Chippewa tribes assigned to their agencies. And then when you all were sent to, your ancestors were sent to Haskell, Genoa, and people that married into other tribes, Sac and Foxes throughout the years. So you all have had historical relationships with other tribes. And then you have identification as an entity, an Indian entity by the petitioner itself. Um, not going not to sugarcoat this. With the Charles Curtis legislation from 1897 and the dissolution in 1900, but not termination, there's places in this that we have the work cut out for us. But your answer, your you are your tribe has a identified pedigree as a tribal nation, going back over two hundred years, and if they and if we had to throw in the Moravian documents like we would have under the previous criteria to twenty fifteen, you all could have traced back to seventeen seventy eight as a tribe. You could have traced back to Janaid and Hood and Shawnbrun and Salem. And you could have traced back to either Israel Lepachachin and Rachel or Jalei Lemon and his wife. Y'all could, could, could have fit in under the previous criteria. So we have all that, but we, we have some issues post-1900 because of the Charles Curtis Act. But I think we can work around those. And so did the attorneys. Um, the, the petitioner must comprise a distinct community and demonstrate that it exists as a community. Distinct community means an entity with constant interactions and significant membership whose members are differentiated from and distinct from non-members. And my phone screen's kind of small here, so I can't read all of this, but I can go right to the part that they asked below. The petitioner may demonstrate that it meets the criterion at a given point, a given point in time by meeting two of the more following forms of evidence or by other evidence to show that a significant portion of the petitioner's members constituted a distinct community at a given point. Um, one, or I, I'll go through the, with the uh, Roman numerals here. Rates of patterns of no marriages within the entity or maybe culturally related patterned out marriages. Social relationships connecting individual members. Rates of pattern or informal social, social interaction exist broadly amongst the members. Shared or cooperative labor or other economic activity, activity among members. Strong patterns of discrimination or other social distinctions by non-members. Shared sacred or secular ritual activity. And cultural patterns shared amongst the portion of the entity that are different from the populations with whom it interacts. These patterns may function as more than an identification of the group as an Indian. They may include, but are not limited to, I'm trying to lower this, uh, get the screen here where I can see all this, uh, organization of, cooperation organization or system, religious beliefs or practices and ceremonies. Um, now let me see if I can enlarge the other. 
I mean, we were going to cover the first two sections today so that people understand this process going forward. I won't go beyond the bottom two, but I'll just kind of give a general layout of this, of the genealogy of the interaction and all those things. This tribal community descends from two families, Caleb's and Kilbuck's. Um, on the Caleb side, you have Israel and Rachel. You have Esther and Ludwig. Uh, you have their child, Caleb, and his wife, Theodora. You have John Rufus, you have John Rufus and Judith, and you have Sibylla and Noah Nathan and Thomas Elliot and Reza Wilcoxon. Um, and I, I'm just going to show how tightly the, the, family, the family organization, how tightly knit genealogically this community is. Um, from the Jalaleman side of it, you have Jalaleman, you have Got Christian Gottlieb, you have Joseph Henry Kilbuck, and then you have William Henry Kilbuck, and you have John Henry Kilbuck again, and you have descendants that go from there. And from the Caleb side of it, I explained I explain that part. To go from John Rufus or Sibylla forward, John Rufus was the parent of Ignatius. Ignatius's kids are Caleb, or Ignatius's descendants are Caleb's, Benton Benders, and we don't hear a lot about these, but Donahoe's, um, Fixes, Hollands, and Mundy's. And forgive me if I've forgotten anybody, but those are the names I have right off the top of my head for that side of the family. Wurzburgers possibly too. Um, on the Sibylla side of it, we don't have we, we haven't encountered a lot of Elliot descendants yet, but we've encountered we but we have the uh, Wilson daughters from the marriage with uh, Noah Nathan and then Katie Ann Nathan's marriage to Anderson Wilson and their daughters were uh, Elizabeth Wilson. Louisa Wilson and Susan Wilson. Eliza, or Elizabeth Wilson is the Spooner ancestor. Uh, Louisa Wilson is the Vicks ancestor. Susan Wilson is the Supernaw ancestor. Um, you have the marriage with Reson Wilcoxon, who 